Welcome to the All NBA Show, part of the All City Podcast Network. I'm your host, Adam Mades. I'm joined by my esteemed colleague, Tim Legler. Legs, we got some more good ones. We got I thought we were gonna have one good one, one bad one last night. I ended up enjoying both games last night. I don't know about you. Yeah, I mean, I you know, being full disclosure, Cody White saved that game because I, I wasn't <laughs> sure. I wasn't listen, I'm gonna be honest, I wasn't particularly like edge no. of my seat for that game. First yeah. game gave us everything you could have imagined there is so much to dive into from that Sixers heat game second one I figured was like okay keep me interested please because I gotta get up super early and 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 uh you know it's, this game's gonna end late but it, it he made it worthwhile and yeah. that alone and and now the next game significantly more interesting for the Bulls because of what happened with Jimmy Butler so this is going to be right. an interesting couple of days it is going to be in a couple, an interesting couple of days, and it's already been an interesting handful of days. This week, man, I just am so – you get to the end of the regular season, you're tired. As an analyst, you're just tired. This week has completely been a shot in the arm of excitement for good basketball ahead for us, so I'm excited to break it all down with you on this show. Uh, we are presented, as always, by DraftKings Sportsbook. Stay tuned because you'll hear more about DraftKings and all it has to offer throughout the show. DraftKings, the crown is yours. All right, the headline story. The 76ers get the win over the Miami Heat last night, 105 to 104. It was a fantastic game that came down to the final three minutes. Um, I, you know, Jimmy Butler ends up getting hurt and plays three quarters with a torn ACL or damaged or MCL, I should say, which is pretty wild. The Heat had a very interesting matchup zone. Uh, there was a lot of different things that I thought was really fascinating about this game. What stood out to you most from this one? Oh my goodness! Uh, I, I well, okay. There, I mean, I literally have a list of about ten things. Love it. But if Let's you're asking me, if you're asking me the the number one thing to come out of this is Joel Embiid is not close yeah. to what he was physically even a couple weeks ago. Like, forget you know pre injury MVP Embiid, which by the way he was pretty close to that when he came back. Let's say he was 90% of that when he came back. And mainly only reason he wasn't was because of a conditioning from a conditioning standpoint, but the dominance was there. The movement was there. The changing ends of the floor was there. All of that was there. And then he got hurt again, whatever, to whatever extent, you know, in that second to last game of the year. And we haven't seen him since then. And I didn't know what it was going to look like last night. And it's clear he's, he's 60% of that player. And that, to me, has to be the number one headliner coming out of this game because I've been saying I think this might represent the greatest threat to the Celtics. They might be the last team standing, and it's impossible to feel that way about them when Joel Embiid looks the way he did last night. Is there any chance from what you saw? Because here's the thing. He made big plays in the clutch. I was actually – because he had a pretty bad game overall or pretty for by his standard – but in the last three or four minutes, he made several plays that were really big, including a three, including an and one, um, and then uh, you know a great some great passes. So I thought he was great in the clutch. Is there any hope that this is okay? He had a some discomfort, misses a game to end the season or a couple games in the season. Is there any chance that this is a thing that he can look better? Was there any hope that you saw that okay maybe he's a little banged up, but a rhythm thing he's going to get better as this playoffs goes. Based on his history, and unfortunately for him, it seems like an annual thing, he gets worse as it goes, whatever he's dealing with. Okay, so you're right. He made plays in the fourth quarter, and and, and I've I, you know been saying today, like he made shots, like the shot making, the threes. He had a three point play. He makes his free throws. Like he can make shots. You know, he was out there in a full body cast. Joel Embiid can make <laughs> shots. He's that skilled and he's that big. He can get shots off. The offensive rebound three-point play, that was one of the few times in the game he like imposed himself physically with right. exertion in traffic. 
He threw people out of the way, got that ball, put it back in, three-point play. It was a big play in the game. He had a couple of important passes to Batum. The one to Oubre underneath the basket for the three-point play was the biggest play of the game. It was a tie game, 40 seconds to go. I mean, that that was the game right there. Um, so, yeah, he made plays to contribute. It wasn't, and his stat line doesn't look terrible. I'm just – look, for me, when I've watched Joel Embiid all these years, and unfortunately we seem like we're always talking about this in the playoffs with him dealing with something – what I always look at with Embiid are there are there are a few areas that specifically tell me, forget the shot making, the other things that tell me how he's yeah. feeling. The first is go back and look at the five or six games he played when he came back from the injury. The dude was changing ends of the floor. He was running, sprinting both directions. He filling the lane, filling the middle on the break, handling the ball on the break, changing ends. He didn't do that yesterday at all. That's first. Secondly, the the when you when he's right, he goes into the paint. He, look, he spends a lot of time in the perimeter at the elbows. That's part of his strength. He goes into the paint more and seals guys on his back and overwhelms you with your his strength. He did it like once in the entire game. And then the last one, this is the most significant one to me. When he's right, he his lateral movement defensively and his presence defensively is what separates him from so many guys that bigs that play in the league, the guy covers ground. He, 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 tr he tracks guards to the rim, you know, from the perimeter. He goes from like block to block to, to, to be a rim deterrent. If a guy's driving baseline, like you'll, he'll, I've seen plays in the postseason he's made in the past where he jumps once when a guard drives, the guard will wrap the ball around his body to drop it off to the big. Cause Embiid came to help. I've seen him land, turn, spin, go up, and block the shot anyway because right. he's that good <clears throat> defensively. None of that last night, a non-factor. So I'm looking at those three areas and saying, okay, what is this? Now, Adam, watching him over the years, and I've been in that building for a lot of playoff games. Joel Embiid, there's other nights when I, I, I have to sit and watch him sometimes because I go, Okay, he's laboring. Is it because the, the anxiety and the stress is getting to him? Because I think that's been a factor for him and why he looks so sluggish sometimes. Last night, maybe there was some of that. But the fact that he was. shot the ball the way he did in the fourth quarter, I don't know that it was that, man. He shot those threes pretty effortlessly. He made free yeah. throws. Like I don't think it was that. I think last night he his leg was stiff. He was constantly fidgeting with his brace which he wasn't when he first came back from the injury. You'd see him sometimes, not the whole game. The whole game, he was messing with it last night. Yeah. Something is bothering him. He doesn't feel close to right, and it manifested itself last night, and they were able to, to, to escape, basically. Nicholas Batum bailed them out last night, and now they live, live on, and they're going to go, and they're going to play the New York Knicks in the first round, and I think the way I'm viewing that series has really changed based on what I saw last night. I think that's the obviously line item number one, and we knew that coming in. Embiid's health, what was it going to look like? And you're right, that last night was not one. I don't, for me personally, and maybe it sounds like you're a little different, I am not drawing conclusions on Embiid's, what Embiid is going to look like in the Knicks series based on last night, but it certainly moves it in the direction of, okay, that was less optimistic. I'm, I'm slightly less optimistic, but I still feel like because he was so good just a week ago or a week and a half ago, that there is a chance that this is a little bit of, as you said, stiffness, rust, whatever you want to say, and that he can bounce back and end up really impacting the series. And as you and I both believe, the 76ers should look at the Eastern Conference and say, all these teams are beatable if we're healthy. Um, another big takeaway from me from this game, we're going to, as I see the chat going off about Batum. We're obviously going to talk about the MVP of the game, Nick Batum. We're going to get into him. The other thing, though, about this game I forgot how much I enjoy watching the Miami Heat in the playoffs. And I know it's going to sound like a crazy take. I know they're not your favorite team, you know, stylistically. They Man. played a matchup zone last night that was so, yeah. to me, just so interesting. And so few teams yeah. can pull off a defensive scheme like that on the fly. And I thought they did a great job of it. It was a slog of a game. But I just think Miami Heat are such an interesting playoff team because of their ability to uh, come up with game plans game by game that are so different and out of the box from everybody else and i thought that was what the story of the game was about last night and to the 76ers credit and nick batum making shots was a big part of this being able to solve a complex defensive scheme is a sign of a great team and last night the 76ers were able to solve it enough to get the win okay 
Let's talk first about this zone in the first half because I'm sitting there and I'm making a million notes and I'm watching this game and I thought the Sixers, uh, um, the Sixers spacing, the f- parts of the floor they were occupying, their attack against that. I've seen better zone offenses in middle school games. I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> it. I'm not exaggerating it, Adam. I swear. Look, I know the Heat. They, they play disrupted. more zone than any team. They play more zone than any team in the league for a reason because they're good at it. And you shouldn't yeah. be allowed to play zone. Not not allowed by rules. I mean, you shouldn't really? be able to get away with oh, playing zone okay. in the NBA. I'm sorry, because here's why. To beat a zone, you have to be able to have dribble penetration in gaps. You have to be able to throw the ball to two areas of the floor in particular that has to be caught in the middle of the lane, foul line area, and on the short mid-corner, short baseline, short corner area. And there's NBA players are too good to prevent that from happening. Their hands are too good. Their precision is too good. Their size is too good. So you, you can throw it where you want. You could dribble penetrate because the guys are that good. And then, of course, you've got the best shooting in the world. So there's no reason to get away with a zone. The reason that Eric Spolster plays it as much as he does is because teams don't run anything against it. And I can't believe if you had three days to prepare whatever for the Heat. And I love Nick Nurse. I don't understand why the spacing was horrible against that zone in the first half. And I could show you, and I'm not just saying, oh, they weren't scoring so the zone was great. No, I'm talking about I could sh- I could go through video right now, play after play after play after play, and show you what the Philadelphia was doing to contribute to that. And it was nuts to me. Now, what changed? Second half, when they had their greatest success, they were getting the ball into that area of floor at the top of the key at the elbows that I'm talking about, including Nicholas Batum twice hit threes because they had to pinch that area because that's where Embiid caught the ball. You pinched off the wing, kick out wing, Batum three. The the Obre play, look where it started. And Bede was at the elbow, caught the ball. They it drew two defenders that tight to the basket. When you're drawing two guys, that means there's got to be space. So on the weak side of the floor, you had Jimmy Butler with a shooter and with Ubre yep. on the baseline behind him. And, and he was frozen for a second because Embiid looked. And Butler was leaning just just enough his body weight toward the three-point line. It was just enough for Ubre to make that baseline cut, catch it, three-point play. It, it, it's nothing complicated, but those areas of the floor have to be occupied and the ball has to get there. And they finally did it. So get you're right. I'm sure Nick Nurse talked about it at halftime, and they made some sort of an adjustment in that way. They were not acting as if they expected to see a zone in the first half. And that <laughs> shocks me. Because that's what the Heat do to you. And yeah. yet yet they made enough plays. And yeah. I, I made a joke this morning on uh, on Get Up. I said I'm going to contact the city officials in Philadelphia and maybe even the governor of the state of Pennsylvania because I think there should be a statue erected of Nicholas Batum outside yeah. Wells Fargo by the time he takes the court in, in the first home game against the Knicks. Because I'm telling you, what he did last night basically gave them a chance to extend their season. Yeah. If he if he doesn't do what he did last night, they lose the game. First of all, they might lose to the Bulls the way Embiid looks in the next game and be gone. <laughs> or at best, you go play the Boston Celtics and get swept. Yeah. That's what Batum did for them last night. You're taking on also a shorthanded team without a star player at all in Randall. And at least now, like it gives you a chance if it beat him, Maxi play well in that series. So that's what Batum did. I can't say enough about what he did last night. And I said to you, he was an X factor. I love the addition. He knocked down six threes. He also had the biggest defensive play of the game, the block on Tyler Hero and the three pointer uh, when he had a chance to tie the game. So Batum bailed him out, but I'm very concerned about what I saw at a Joel Embiid last night and some other guys on their team I thought played tight in that game. And that's concerning. Do you know how many six three-point games Nick Batum had this season, Legs? Zero. zero. I would say zero. <laughs> how many has he zero. had in his career, I wonder? It, I mean, So I just pulled it up. He's had – that was his 13th time okay. having six made threes. His that's record is actually I, nine. That's more than I would have said. I know, he, I know he can knock down threes. I would have said he's done that a couple of times maybe. Well, he had nine back in 2012. So wow. we're going back quite a ways before we start to really see where he was making threes at that volume. But – you know what? That's the thing about a one-off play-in game. That's what makes him great is a player can get hot. But more than that, I don't want to just say a guy got hot, even though that's the case, 6 of 10. Look, he ran a little hot. He knew what shots he needed to take, and that's half the battle. And in that zone, Embiid made some great passes. Some of this came with, with Embiid off the court. But in the fourth quarter, he hit a couple that were very timely. 
especially in minutes when you were looking at them saying, where's the point, where are the points going to come from with this group? You got to, you got to score in these moments and he hit them there. So for me, it was a really impressive player and he are a really impressive game. And when you talk about a zone, he's sort of perfectly designed to be a guy to take advantage of it because one, he can make those shots, but two, you you're making it sound like a zone is easy to, to score against. I've seen enough teams in the NBA struggle. I agree with you that it shouldn't be as hard as teams make it, but you still have to read the court somewhat quickly with a team like, like Miami. And he's a guy that can make quick decisions and connective passes and take advantage and make the zone rotate. So I thought that was, I don't want to just chalk this up to good shot making. I thought it was a great all around game from Batum. No, there's no doubt about it. And the other thing that he did provide, and, and, and this goes to some of the issues they've had in the postseason in the past at home since Embiid's been there. Um, yeah. And it's not just Embiid. It's been some of his teammates in general. I, listen, I've been there, and I'm telling you, it's, it's a weird thing. You're sitting there before the game in a playoff game in Wells Fargo, and the thickness in the air and the anxiety level of the people sitting in that building is transferred onto the court in yeah. a way that unlike any place I've ever seen, ever. And, and, and it, I think you sense it. Like You might not sense it at all for the 72 hours leading up to that first game or the warm-ups. You're out there and you're bebopping around. you got your headphones on. Or you're, having, you're in a good mood. You're making shots and warm-ups. That ball goes up in the air at 730. I'm telling you something. They sense it. And there's booing that starts in early. And they're like, because they, yeah. they, they, they want a championship for this franchise so badly that you, you just feel it. And I've seen guys, I man, it's a lot. It's a lot. I thought Heald was tentative in the first half. He passed up looks early. I thought Ubre looked tentative in the first half. Maxi overall, I don't think was necessarily tentative a little bit early. He's going to be okay. I thought he played a fairly normal game for him. The zone, the zone against him, I think was more problematic than, than anybody else because he, he really relies on that ball screen action in a man to man where he could turn a corner, get downhill and or or stop and shoot a three if you go under like a zone takes some of that away for the most part i don't think he played a terrible game he certainly wasn't wasn't like his normal best but i don't think he was affected necessarily by the pressure and that's what i've been counting on i keep saying it that's what simmons was that's what harden was that won't be maxi i've said that a hundred times right and i'm not sure yet after one game because it was right. some of it i saw but then i was like okay no i think he's okay he just didn't necessarily have a great game but other guy, Tobias Harris, clearly, my goodness. I mean, Tobias Harris, though, he's got a track record of this in at home in the playoffs. And they started booing him early and often. And he shot one three on an open three that that almost wedged in the mm. rim and backboard area. And that was pretty much it, it for him for the night. But Toom carries himself, man, in a way so calm, cool, and collected. Like, I just – it looked – completely natural to him to be in that environment. And man, oh man, do the Sixers need a guy like that. Yeah. I think he's going to be huge for them. What about, you know, what do you take away from this? What do you think the Knicks take away from this now as they prepare for the 76ers? Is there something they saw that you think, okay, it changes the dynamic. They're going to attack this or they're going to try that in the series. I think the two happiest people in the world are, are, are Jalen Brunson and Tom Thibodeau watching that game. How could you not be? <laughs> Looking at Joel Embiid, how could you not be? And listen, you know, you know, Brunson's going to put a bunch of people in ball screen anyway. It doesn't matter if, if that's, you know, who, who who's defending it. Greatest defensive center of all time. He's got it because that's his game. Oh. But now, looking at Embiid, you got to put him in every imaginable situation to draw him out away from the basket and see how much ground he can cover. And, and that was already part of their game plan. But I think maybe now that's even like, that's even like more important for them. I think there's going to be opportunities on the offensive glass because he just was not – his numbers are, are good rebounding-wise because he's so big they come to him. He wasn't getting a lot of those really tough ones last night. And that's where I think offensive rebounding, which can be a strength of the Knicks, I think that could be a problem for Philly. I'm, if I'm Thibodeau, I'm saying don't worry about crashing the glass if you don't get it because he a beat is not beating you to the other end of the floor. He doesn't look like it. So let's go. Let's go after it. Let's attack the glass. Because that's when Embiid's playing great, man, and you go in there and you miss it, and he rebounds it or somebody else, he will run straight down the middle of the floor, and now you're putting some poor wing or guard in an impossible situation trying to stop him from getting to the basket. I'm looking at that if I'm Thibodeau saying, all right, I think that's off the table. He's not going to be out run, outrunning anybody. So let's go to the glass, let's pound the glass, and, and take advantage of opportunities there. I think in general you just feel a little bit more relieved that like you're not getting 
the best version of him. And everybody right. was waiting to see what he looked like. And by the way, like I said, I don't, how does you think, I just don't know how this is going to get better game to game, uh, you know, as far as how he feels. That's not his track record. It's the opposite right. with him when it, with a lower body injury. And a lot of guys, I mean, it's not just him. There's a lot of guys. When you have a lower body injury, it's not like that's going to get better throughout a playoff run. But particularly for a dude that's big and heavy and it's a lot of stress on that knee every time you jump with all that weight coming down on it, it's a lot to ask. So I just think it was encouraging for the Knicks. I think the opportunity has been opened even greater. Giannis banged up. Embiid banged up. Butler out. You didn't have to deal with him. He, he may, Maybe Miami wins that game if he doesn't get hurt. You don't have to deal with that. So everything to me, a little bit brighter in terms of the prospects for the New York Knicks. I think you're right. And I think if you talk about lateral movement from a big, Jalen Brunson is, he's maybe not number one in terms of guys that is hardest to guard if you're not mobile, you know, left, right, mobile as a big, but he's certainly not far down the list. That's not the easiest guy to cover out in space if you're a big guy. So I'm with you. Um, real quick, any other notes? You sounds like you have some more notes on this game. Any other big picture stuff that you you take away from this game, specifically on the 76ers, but on the heat as well? I think for... Nick Nurse, I think maybe you're a little bit concerned over some of the guys that you're real, you're real, you know, really counting on to provide some of that perimeter shooting, right? That you're going to have to have off Maxi and Embiid, and I, I, I'm a little bit concerned. Um, like I said, Buddy Hield had a decent second half. You didn't br bring Buddy Hield in there to play 18 minutes to score seven points and take go three for eight from the field. Yep. He was supposed to be much more important than that. So what's going on there? I, I'm, I'm just that kind of jumped out to me. Kelly Oubre played 37 minutes and his defense was important in this game. Um, but they also he's also a guy that can be really a big time X factor offensively. Neither one of those guys did a whole lot, and 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 Maxi was six for 16. Maxi was you know below average for him. So I'm just looking at it. And if I'm Nick Nurse and you know that Embiid, let's say you, you kind of know like he's not right, who are you going to really count on? Now, here's what I said just now on first take, Adam. I, my challenge is going to be issued to Tyrese Maxey. Okay, listen, this dude blew up this year, and I'm a big fan, and you are too. Guy can play. He had three 50-point games in the same season. He's, all, he's that level of like when he gets it going, he's dangerous. Well, guess what? Here we are, man. The Knicks have one star. He's healthy. The other one's out. Sixers have two, and Bede's limited. We're going to – I think we're going to have a really interesting discussion about Tyrese Maxey in this series as it goes on, especially if Embiid continues to look limited because it's like, okay, man, are you that guy? Can you go get us 25-30 every night in this series? Because you you should be able to get those kind of opportunities. I know the Knicks are a good defensive team, but Maxi had and great they have numbers great defenders them. for him. They he have had great, great numbers for him. against them though this year. Great yeah. numbers. So his quickness, I think, could overcome great defense and his range. He he's got two things that kind of sometimes they can supplant great defense. Man, he can shoot it from deep and he can be by you in a blur. I, let's see. What do you got, man? What are you? Are you want to cr climb a rung on that ladder in public perception? This is your chance. This is your chance because you were an all-star this year. You're a 26-point-per-game scorer, and your partner is, is limited. What can you do to make up for that? That's what that's the challenge that I'm issuing to Tyrese Maxey. Like you, got, you can't be what you were last night throughout this series. You right. need to be 25 to 30 and efficiently, and maybe one night that means you go for 40 if that's what it takes because you did it in the regular season. Let's go. Like this, you know, do you want to be regarded as that level player? This is your opportunity. Big series for him coming up. If we go to the Heat side of this real quick, I loved what we saw from Jaime Jaquez, except for the very end of the game. He had two horrible mistakes. One, Embiid catches the ball at the foul line. That's his sweet yeah. spot. And Jaime Jaquez starts pawing at the ball, which is something you would do against Andre Drummond or you know most bigs who don't have yeah. – like Joel Embiid, that's you can't pot the ball against Joel Embiid. He knows exactly what to do. He drew the easy foul against him and got free throws. And then on the ensuing play, he dribbles down and gets the ball poked away from him. It turns into a fast break the other way, which was the Joel Embiid three-pointer. Those two plays, if you eliminated even one of them, the Heat might have won this game. You give them both. If you eliminated both of them, I'd say for sure the Heat won this game. So we had two critical errors. 
and it almost spoiled what I thought was otherwise a very positive game. And in particular, if you contrast it with Tyler Hero, who I actually hated Tyler Hero's game in this one. He drove me nuts in this game, took 27 shots, which I know they depend on him a lot. Their late game offense was a lot of just giving him the ball and letting him run pick and roll and jack up shots. But nonetheless, that was one of my big takeaways from the Heat is I just, I love Jaime Hawkins, so maybe I'm too high on him. But I thought he had a great game until the very end. And and if they're going to win this next game without Jimmy Butler, I think he's going to have to have a, a, an even better performance. I agree with you. I, I, I would agree with you on that. And I, I didn't think his start was particularly great. He got better as the game went on. He looked more comfortably settled in. He can play, man. And he 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 you know made his presence felt. I agree. Those were a couple of mistakes. I got another one here, though, I want to talk about on the Heat. And I don't understand. I, I just don't get why I feel like more often we just kind of let games like this from Bam Adebayo go. Ooh. Let's not talk about it. Jimmy Butler. Jimmy Butler. I, first of all, I can't tell you how much respect I have for this dude for finishing this game. Okay. He's no, especially, especially knowing what we know now, but <laughs> even in the moment, Adam, I'm like, yeah, he screamed out like audibly. You could hear it. even watching on TV. They talked about it on the broadcast. Like, like JJ Reddick said, you know, the scream and then gets up. I mean, I'm thinking there's no, well, there's no way he's finishing this game, finishes the game. You see, he could barely walk out of the arena last night. Now we know he's got an MCL injury. We don't know the extent of it, but weeks out, whatever. It's a serious injury. And he played the rest of the game, but he wasn't great offensively in this game. He, he was five for 18 from the field and he was limited from that point on. Okay. Hero was doing what he could offensively making some shots. You're right. He had a terrible shooting night overall, but at least he was giving him some offense. Where is Bam out of bio? And this is a guy that we think it's just automatic. Yep. Bam out of bio going to the Olympic team. Like he's an Olympian. Wait a second. The guy's an all-star, right? Am I mistaken? Am I missing something? Man. The guy's an all-star. He's on the Olympic team. Where was he? Where was Bam Adebayo and Joel Embiid is playing on like a leg and a half? Where was he? And we don't question it. Like, it doesn't come up once today. We just, I just talked about that game for four straight hours on TV, on ESPN, basically. It, and and it, it didn't come up. And I'm saying I think it should come up. I should come up. You got to give us more than that. You got to give them more than 10 points, nine shots in a game like that, man. It's a one possession game late and beads hurt. Butler's hurt. They need you. And it's just not to be found, man. And we did, but it's just like, again, we just accept it. You got a team put together. We got, we got to go win a game, you know, over in, over in Europe this summer. He's our guy. And I'm just like, I don't, well, well then why don't we stay? Where was he last what, night? Do you agree with me? Or do you think I'm, you know, I'm, I'm overstating that? I, I don't think I do <laughs> because I think his impact, he goes back and forth. I don't know that he's an every night two-way player. He's going to have to be in this next play-in game, which we'll talk about in a little bit. His job last night was to anchor that zone and to guard Joel Embiid, and I thought he did a decent job of that. So to me, maybe it's expectation, right? You're expecting him to be that and to go and get you over the hump offensively. And last night, Embiid Wait, okay, is no, let, me big... just, let me stop you there for a second. I agree with you. He's not an every-night offensive player. That, it wasn't an every-night. It's one night. It's it's tonight. Well, that's, like, we yeah, need yeah. you. Jimmy it Butler's hurt. Game. I'm seriously. Yeah. like, why, why why can't he be more aggressive? I'm not saying the dude's got to be a 30-point scorer. I'm just saying, uh, why can't he find a way to be a little bit more aggressive and get them? You're talking, Adam, about a couple of baskets in this yeah. game would have made an enormous difference yeah. down the stretch couple of buckets would have made a big difference to win the game and and look at now look as it turns out butler butler being hurt like i mean that's gonna be a tough series against the knicks without jimmy butler if they were to advance I, okay i get that but i'm just saying in the moment you like kind of read the room like we need a little bit more offense he is capable of it and i just didn't yeah. i didn't really notice him offensively at all in the second half I think it's a fair point. And maybe what you're really doing is respecting him even more than me because you're telling you're holding him to a higher standard, saying he's capable of doing this. Correct. Whereas I'm almost Correct. viewing it in this, and I'm almost viewing it as I wouldn't expect that from him given what he had to do defensively. But to your point, last night, guys step up. Guys of his caliber step up that's, in those moments sometimes. Thank you. That's, you're summing up that's yeah. what I'm trying to say. And it's like so people People, and I can see there's like some people that are Heat fans or whatever, like, bam, and I buy it or coming at me. Go ahead, man. Come at me all you want to. The guy makes the all-star game every year. <laughs> He's capable of more than this. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. They needed it. They yeah. needed it tonight. They needed it. Where are you? 
Where are you? Figure out a way to, well, to give me well, a couple baskets. That's all I'm saying. I'm not well, asking a dude to go get 30. He had 10 points in a game that you lost with 40 seconds to go. You're in a tie game. That's all I'm saying, man. And your best player's hurt. Like, that's the time. He is capable of it. It's actually a compliment that I'm even saying this to him. Because if he wasn't worthy of this, I wouldn't bring it up. It is what it is. You got what right. you got out of Bam. No, there's more there yeah. some nights. And last night was a night it needed to be. That's all I'm saying. Well, I'm bummed that Jimmy Butler will be out of the playoffs, whether the Miami Heat are or not. I just – that guy, he is a frustrator. I get all of your frustrations with him as a player, but that guy is a hell of a competitor. And no doubt, the man. ultimate no – getting the playoffs, man, and he is just the ultimate guy to uh, to battle there, and I'm sad we'll miss him. Let's no, go to break, sick, though. Feel sick for him, yeah. Feel sick for him. Let, let's go to break. On the other side, you were asking about guys that step up. How about Kobe White giving a career high for you in a must-win game? It was against the Hawks, but whatever. We're going to talk about that one briefly. We'll also preview the final play-in games that are coming up for us on Friday. And then we'll end the show by talking about the Mavs Clippers. I already gave my piece about them, but you guys want to hear Legs' take on it, as do I. So we'll get to that and more on the other side. First, I'm going to tell you guys about the Game Time app. Right now, if you're looking for playoff tickets... Don't be intimidated by the price. Hop on game time. That way you know you're going to get the guaranteed lowest prices you can find. They have flash deals, zone deals, last-minute tickets. You can even set an alert for a very specific ticket. You have your eye on this courtside seat you've been thinking about. Uh, put a little alert on there. It's just a little too high. Maybe it'll come down right before a tip-off. They'll give you a push notification that lets you know whenever the ticket you had your eye on is uh, become available or lowered in price. They also, it's a great way for you to find out what's just going on in your neck of the woods. Maybe you don't have a game near where you live, but you do have some festivals, concerts, or events. You can hop on there and see what's popping this weekend and plan your weekend accordingly. Game Time app. So go, hey, right now, download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code ALLNBA for $20 off your first purchase. Again, that's code ALLNBA for $20 off. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. I also want to tell you about the presenting sponsor of this show, which is, of course, DraftKings Sportsbook. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code ALLNBA. The 82-game preseason is in the books. Half of the play-in is in the books. It's finally time for the real season. Don't miss out on any of the NBA playoff action at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. From the play-in tournament through the finals, DraftKings Sportsbook has you covered with same-game parlays, live betting, odds boosts, and so much more. If you listen to our producer, Emma, she is the queen of the same-game parlay. She is always showing me her parlay bets. You can do live betting, though. Even if you got in late on the games, they'll have live lines for you that are a lot of fun to bet on. And then tomorrow, we're going to be dropping our – we're recording it later today, but we're dropping our betting preview where we're going to pick every single series – and we're going to try to predict how many games it goes, as well as say who we think will be the MVP of every single series. So look for that on our YouTube channel. But download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code ALLNBA. New customers bet $5 and get 200 in bonus bets instantly. That's code ALLNBA only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Or in West Virginia, visit 1-800-GAMBLER.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 and over, age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.co slash bball for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. Back here, segment two of the All NBA Show. Don't forget to hit that like button. Subscribe if you're new to the channel. We're doing this four times a week, breaking down all of the playoff action. You're going to want to get Legs' as insight every single night in the NBA. Uh, you know who else is upset with Bam out of bio, Legs? Who? Super producer Emma. She's texted me expletives right now. She lost a parlay on Bam apparently last night. So she's oh, with boy. you. She's just as mad. What was she? What was the number? I took what him was for, it? I took him for twelve plus points. He yeah, oh. Emma, 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 <laughs> he's an Olympian. I he's know Olympian. it was cash legs. It was cash. That's a that is an uncontested layup. Yeah, that's a tough that, one. I was so point. mad. I was by so the way, mad. By the way, there were three. We did this, just played a game yesterday on TV. They do this game sometimes, like take over under, whatever. It's kind of like this, but it's not, we're not laying money on it, but we're just predicting. There were three of them and they were all unders in the mm. game. And guess what they were? And tell me what you would have gone with these. Uh, Jimmy Butler, 23 and a half points. I took the under. I was right on that. I probably would have been wrong 
if he didn't, if get, he hurt. didn't get hurt. Yeah. Okay. So I would have been wrong. And he got off to a start early. I'm, like, I'm probably going to be wrong about that, but I ended up being right. Um, Tyrese Maxey, two and a half made threes. I, wow. I thought that's an over. Yeah. Didn't get it. Didn't get yeah. there. And then the other one was related to uh, Embiid. I don't know, I have something related to his points, and he didn't get it either. So all three yeah. were under. It was uh, one of those rough. kind of games. There you go. Um, a, a good game, a surprisingly good game, was the Chicago Bulls beating the Atlanta Hawks. I actually don't even know if this was a good game, to be honest with you. I, I spoke too soon. But a great performance from Kobe White. No Jalen Johnson. He got hurt last week. He would have made this game a lot more interesting because he's another one of my favorite players to watch on a bad team. But Kobe White has been such a story this year. And then what an even better story to go 15 of 21. This wasn't a 42 piece that took 40 shots legs on a bad team. And he was just oh, chucking man. them up 15 of 21. He also had nine rebounds, six assists, two steals. How many turnovers in 43 minutes, zero turnovers in 43 minutes. He was such, it wasn't like, look, it, it's the Alex. This game was unbelievable. He had everything deep threes, regular threes, spin move layups, incredible passing i just love this was a show kobe white put on a show last night uh i texted you we, we texted during the game or maybe right after what did i say to you remember i said that was kyrie-esque yeah i like the comp too that's what it reminded me of especially like that play that spin he had in open in the open floor with those two defenders back man that was a thing was beauty. unbelievable that's got in and did any yeah, had no space, and somehow he didn't touch either one of them. He got through there, <laughs> like, and it was so lightning quick. And it was like, it was so, and your word was improvisational, right? It's such a yep. great, and that's what Kyrie, that's what Kyrie reminds yep. me of, man, when he's cooking. And that's what Kobe White reminded me of, except in a different way. Like, it was, it was, he was like floor general, too. He was both, right? And Kyrie is like, when he's like that, he's in that raw scorer mode, and he's unstoppable. He's that talented. Kobe White was doing both. Like he's commanding the show. He's also putting on a show and he's putting up numbers. He's doing it with flair. I, it was sensational. He's had a great year, but man, oh man, what a signature game to cap off a, 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 a best season of your career. He did it. And he did it, by the way, against this, you know, this backcourt, this hype <laughs> backcourt. And DeJounte oh. Murray, DeJounte Murray was really, really good. Trey Young was a minus 27 in the game. Felt and, like it. And Kobe White owned it, owned it. And yeah. I give him credit, man. That was super entertaining. It was what that game needed because, you know, we were all excited about the other three games of, of the last yeah. two nights. Not so much about this one. That's it's why it was last, you know, on the second night. And you're thinking like, okay, there's so much storylines in the Sixers Heat game. It's like, I think that's all the content we're going to probably need. Let's see what happens in this game. And here, lo and behold, Kobe White gave it to us. He made that game interesting. And otherwise, I don't know that it would have been to too many people. So I want to. I just want to talk about the Kyrie comp on this because here's what those two players share in common. A lot of players, they are almost deliberate in their movements. You know, I'm going to drive to the middle and I'm going to read if the help comes and then I have a pass or I have a drive. Maybe I have a spin. I have this or that. And it's very deliberate. There's like a series of events. I almost feel like Kobe White just goes and trusted his reaction speed. He's an offensive yeah. player that is constantly just trusting. He has no idea what move he's about to do, but oh, the defense rotates and I go yeah. behind the back and I spin and I do this. And he's become a remarkably good decision maker at that speed, at that sort of chaotic pace. And that's what him and Kyrie have in trouble They're, are in common. Sometimes you watch Kyrie and it's like eight dribbles and you're like, what are you doing? Where are you going? And then all of a sudden an opening and he finds it and he goes. And that is the, that was what Kobe White was doing nonstop. Just where are you going? What are you doing? Oh, a perfect layup. That's what you're doing. Completely agree. Um, you know, he got some help. The Rosen was efficient and good like he normally is. Vucevic played really well, 24 and 12. Caruso is an interesting one, man, because, you know, he got hurt yeah. in the game. and kept playing. I'm not exactly sure what is going on with him for this next game. But all of a sudden, look, first out, of all. He's out. He's out. The, the news so, is so he's there you out. Go. That's, 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 a, that's a big loss. But yep. you are getting you know, a Heat team. That's now lost Jimmy Butler. I think the Bulls, the Bulls have been playing really well, man, over the last few weeks. And I was just talking to a couple of people that like called Knicks games and analyzed Knicks games in the studio and stuff. And so they see the team every night and they just saw the Bulls three times in a short period of time. And they're both they're both like nervous about like the Bulls, like or not nervous about them, but they're just saying the Bulls can win this game. 
even if Butler had played, like they're that hot right now. You take Butler out of the equation, you know, what do you think? Yeah, you know, I mean, Chicago now all of a sudden's looking at this, you say, wow, okay, we got to go to South Beach, but they don't have Jimmy Butler. And they they just absolutely tuned up Atlanta. They, their offense looked incredible. Kobe White's playing great. I think now talk about increasing that window of opportunity. I think the Bulls window of opportunity now is clearly expanded. Well, I think with these injuries, it, it clearly has. Really quickly on the Hawks, though, I mean, this was a shameful performance from the Hawks. They clearly had much uh, reported a team that seems to be ready to split up, and now they have a chance yeah. to split up and go different directions because they don't seem to enjoy playing for one another, nor are they particularly talented. But here's the thing. We hail the play-in and how great it is, and it's made some of these games more interesting and more compelling and stuff. We just brush over the fact that a team like this Atlanta Hawks at 36 and 46 just had a chance to make the play in. It's when you watch a game like that, you actually laugh and go, All right, every year there might be one team that makes this play in where we're like, What are we doing here? How does this team yeah. still have a shot? Yeah, I agree with that. I, I, you know, overall, it's a good thing. I think, you know, you're going to get this sometimes, yeah. though. And, and that was definitely one last night for Atlanta. I mean, I thought the body language is terrible. Um, it just, just couldn't be more unimpressed with what I watched out of yeah. them last night um, and the exact opposite for Chicago. So listen, Atlanta season um, comes to an end. Chicago has an opportunity here. Um, that, and now because of the way Kobe White played, I'm really, really, really looking forward to that game. Chicago and Miami. So Jimmy Butler, <laughs> this is funny. I think they said Torney MCL timeline is several weeks. So he's obviously out. That was true last night, and he still played. I don't know if they've ruled him out for tomorrow night, so maybe he just tries to say, hey, I don't know. I don't need my MCL. I'll just go out there and play. But in all likelihood, obviously out, Caruso out. Um, what do you see in this game? Just real quickly, you don't have to go in depth on it, but if you were to pick, what, do you, what are you looking for, and who do you think wins it? Honestly, man, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Normally, I've got such a you know quick, strong opinion on, on yeah. about anything you could ask me. I have no freaking idea what is going to happen in this game because i don't know to what extent is miami going to be able to score at all at all like their defense is going to show up and and they're going to mix defenses up and i'm sure spo's going to have a great game plan and everything else and they're going to be tough and it won't be easy but how in the world are they going to generate enough offense where is their offense going to come from that is going to be able to match i think chicago that's got a lot of firepower man kobe white's playing great you know, DeMar DeRozan is capable of having a 35-point game in this game yeah, and do yeah. it efficiently and get 12 free throws. And, like, that's who DeMar DeRozan is, man. He's, he's, he's got a great playoff track record of showing up in big games. So you got you got two guys to deal with on that level. Um, and then Vucevic is a problem for you. So I, I don't know. I, I'm going to see, as we sit here, the more I, I talk it through, I think Chicago wins the game. You know what? It's entirely possible. You think Kobe White fares better against the zone than Tyrese Maxey did? Get, talk about getting through the gaps, you know, getting yeah. through the seams in, yeah. a, in a zone. Yeah. Like, that's kind of Kobe White what he's great at. Like, Tyrese Maxey, quick downhill, getting quick. Kobe White's good at just finding the tiniest little cracks and slithering through them. I, I know. I like that. And I think that Kobe White is also going to – he un, he's going to be better at – because you don't just get in gaps against the zone to score. You get in gaps to draw people to kick. And Kobe White's better at that than Maxi. That's not Maxi's yeah. strength. Maxi's not a Max, Maxi's not an elite playmaker. He's a scorer. And so when he gets in the gaps, it's going to be, can I get to the rim or shoot a floater? He's got good little floaters and runners. He shoots off one foot. Kobe White can get in a gap with the full intent of understanding, I'm doing this to create space on the opposite side of the floor for a shooter. So I think in that way, no, I think you're right. Kobe White, I think, actually would be more effective attacking it than Maxi was. What I hope happens is Bam Adebayo goes for 30 and takes over. And then our next show, we're talking about how he responded because legs brought it out of him. That's what I'm rooting for here. From now on, um, you're not allowed to call him Bam Adebayo. He will be referred to as Bam, the Olympian Adebayo from this point <laughs> forward. That's how you're going to refer to him. And I'm not, listen, I'm not, oh, I'm not coming out hard at Bam Adebayo. I love Bam Adebayo. Yeah. I do. Yeah. I do. I'm having some fun with this. Bothered you last night, though. Yeah. I'm having some fun with it, but but, but it, every point we made earlier is valid. It's yeah, it's it they needed you to be better and give them more offense on a given night. Just a little better too. Step it up a little bit, man. Just and at least look if he missed six shots in the paint or whatever, and he's a pretty good mid range jump shooter. If you go zero for six in the fourth, all right, it's one of those nights you didn't do it. But I didn't notice him. On the court, yeah. 
offensively. That's what I'm saying. Like, you, you, like, come on, man. Make your presence felt. That's all we were saying. We're just having some fun with Bam. Making the Olympic teams an honor, Bam. Congratulations. I'm not trying to denigrate that. Just saying, come on. Give me, give me a little bit more last night. The other play-in game happening Friday, the Western Conference won. It's very interesting in that the Kings are facing the Pelicans for the sixth time this year, legs, the sixth time, and their record coming into it will be 0-5. This will be a chance <laughs> for them to win. But, of course, Zion Williamson out for this game, so the Pelicans are not the Pelicans. They're a completely different team. Brandon Ingram has to bounce back from being benched. So Pelicans have a lot of drama, whereas the Kings have that cathartic win over the Warriors. What are you looking for in this one, and what stands out? All right, a few things. So I'm looking at the Pelicans. I'm going, yeah, first off, sick. I'm sick for Zion. I mean, you know, he had such a great game. And it, it was going to be interesting to see, like, now the platform, if they're able to, you know, advance, let's see him in a first-round series. and Because this is the bar you just set for yourself. I was really curious to see how he was going to accept that and what he was going to give us because he is fun to watch. And so I'm sick for him, first of all. Secondly, though, look, it looks like, okay, you got – the two stars for a uh, Sacramento healthy. Um, these are two all-star players, Fox and Sabonis. Keegan Murray was out of his mind in the first game. We both like him a yeah. lot. That even by even by how much we like him, that was certainly going above and beyond what he did to the Warriors. Okay, so those are the three main offensive weapons. I look at the Pelicans and I go, okay, you're right. Zion's out. Brandon Ingram was hurt for a long time. He didn't look hurt the other night. He 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 was actually he didn't shoot well, but he was aggressively seeking shots. He didn't look in any way hampered, okay? He was trying to get his get his game going. He just didn't. Yeah. They took him out, and then it was like a bad look. He kind of looked disengaged and pouty on the bench. I don't know what's going on there. If the, But listen, the bottom line is, is Brandon Ingram capable of having you know, a 30-point game? Absolutely he is. So that's what it's going to come down to. Can McCollum and Ingram, who between the two of them, on a given night, they can give you 45, 50 points of offense. If they can do that to offset some of what Zion, you know, doesn't ha is not providing because he's not there, playing the game at home, right? Yeah. I mean, I think I think you got it. You got a real chance. Now I don't know if I'm going to necessarily pick them to win. I think my money would go on De'Aaron Fox and Sabonis probably now that they got Me this too. opportunity. I think I'd pick the Kings to win the game, but it, it, it's silly to think just because Zion's not there, Pelicans don't have enough. They, we've talked about their depth all year. And they still right, have two yeah. guys that are capable of lighting it up. So let's see. And they've been well without Zion. They've been well without Ingram. So they're they're even though it hasn't happened recently, they they do have experience this year playing with the team that'll be out there. So that's at least gives them something. All right, let's move on now to our uh, the last segment of today's show. We want to talk about this uh, Clippers Mavs matchup. I'm calling it my my favorite matchup of the first round. I think it's the one I'm most interested in. I shared my thoughts the other day. I think it's star-studded. We want to see how healthy Kawhi is. Like Joel Embiid, the entire series is going to come, probably comes down to Kawhi's health. If he's healthy, this is a great series. If he's not, I have a hard time envisioning them beating the Mavs. But let's assume he's really healthy and looks good in this playoffs here. Where do you start when you start to analyze this one? Mm. Well, you know, you, you're clearly going to go to the stars first. And, I, you know, the first thing I always do when I'm looking at a series, I look at the stars and I look at, what are the odds or chances based on the personnel coaching or scheme of the other team to be able to deal with that star player and, and somehow, you know, make him less efficient, make it a tough series for him. I just don't see anybody having that effect on Luka Doncic. I don't think it's possible. I say I agree. the same thing about Jokic. They're the two guys in this league right now. And LeBron probably on the cusp of that, that there's just not an answer for Luka's going to do his thing. You're not going to stop him from doing that. He's going to get his shots when he wants. He's going to pick you apart with his passing. He just is. He's going to control it. So I don't think that's going to happen. Now, you could say, hey, is the same thing true about Kawhi Leonard if he's healthy? He's going to do his thing. He is. He's not going to do the level of damage offensively right. that Luka is. He's just not. He's Now, look, he might get 30 and go 12 for 18. That's, that's a Kawhi Leonard type game to do that kind of stuff. If he looks right, he's capable of doing that. So now let's go beyond that. Let's just assume both of those guys, they're at their top, man. They do their thing, play their game. Now we start moving out of the roster. It come, for me, it comes down to who do you trust? Who do you trust? And right now, I trust Kyrie Irving more than anybody else based on the way Kyrie has played. I trust Kyrie Irving more than Harden, more than Paul George, more than Westbrook. I trust Kyrie more. 
I think Kyrie's going to be great in this series. And I think he knows it's how important it is that he be great um, coming in. There's a lot of focus on this team, and Luka's certainly counting on him. And I think Kyrie's going to try to be, make sure he does not let him down. I think he's going to be great. And he's not going to be affected by the pressure. He never is. That won't be a problem with Kyrie Irving. And, and so now you start to continue to go down the roster. I just love the way the role players from Dallas – all fit, find their lane, stay in their lane because Luca is going to take everything else off your plate. Just do these few things that you do well. Just do that. Don't do anything else. I'll do the rest. I will set this table. And I think that's how it's going to go. And that's why you know how high I am on the Mavericks. Uh, Clippers have enough talent to win the series. There's no doubt about it. My faith is in Luca being him and then Kyrie being possibly the next best series, next best player in the series. I think you're right about that. How I look at this series, the more I think about it, even from the other day when I talked about the series on the show, I think about it as, okay, you're going to try to guard Dallas with your switches. You want to play one-on-one -on -one defense, what have you. I think Luka's going to be able to solve that. I think Kyrie's going to be able to solve that. They're just too hard to guard one-on-one. -on -one. You go to the other side, Dallas is better equipped than they have been in the past by a mile at guarding the Clippers, and the Clippers do have some different ways they can try to attack you, but their comfort zone is to try to give the ball to Kawhi, to Paul George, to James Harden, and let them do their thing. I think Dallas has enough defenders, and I think they have enough lineups they can throw out where they're not going to have, all right, we got to survive this lineup because we got some not-so-good defensive matchups. No, they have enough guys. They can play 48 minutes with, okay, he switched out onto Kawhi, he switched out onto Harden. Let's see. Let's see what they have. And they're going to score. You're not going to shut them down. But I think that Dallas is going to be able to find – runs, r find stops, string together three, four stops throughout the courses of the series enough times to be able to get separation, whereas I don't think that's going to happen with the Clippers defense. It's a great point. Um, I think another factor in this, look, if, you, if you're if picking the Clippers, I mean, I'm sorry, if you're picking the Mavericks the way that I am, and I haven't really kind of taken – you know, account of how this looks in terms of all the different people that pick these series. I don't know. Have you, I didn't see the other day when you broke it down. Did you, are you picking the Mavericks to win the series? Well, we'll give our picks on our special here uh, that uh, we'll record later today and it'll drop tomorrow. Okay. Well, I mean, it's no secret where I'm going to go because I much I've talked about the team, but, but, but here's, here's, here's the thing to, to do that. If you, if you think these teams are pretty even, that could mean winning a game seven on the road. Right. And, historically we know what that looks like the percentages are not in your favor but yeah. luka Doncic has a pretty decent track record of doing something like that yeah, yeah. <laughs> right he went into phoenix and obliterated that team obliterated yeah. that team right so and i remember even going back a few years ago he won two games in that series against the clippers including a buzzer beater uh he best base practically by himself it felt like got two against a team that was vastly outmanned and, and he won two games in that series. My point is though, if you get to that situation where you're in a game seven on the road, if it goes the distance, I mean, is there, you know, who do you trust? Maybe, maybe more than Luca, the only guys, maybe Jokic that in that spot is, you know, they're going to be ready for that. They're going to have something special for that. So that's, that's why normally if, if I'm picking a team, that's the underdog, I, you got to go, okay, six games then because they're probably not winning a game seven on the road. And then when you start to say that, wow, six games, that sounds like you're not giving the favorite any chance at all, right? So, uh -oh. But with Luka, I can say seven games and they win it on the road in game seven if, if like that that's – because that's how confident I am in Luka Doncic in that moment. I'm so interested to see how this series starts. I mean, obviously it's going to start in L.A., but I <laughs> – I'm almost trending more towards I would be less surprised if Dallas won early than I would if they lost the series. And I just the more I think about it, the more I think they're great. I will say on the Clippers side, there's two X factors. The first one for me is Russell Westbrook. Mm -hmm. I, and I think it's because of the Kyrie piece of this. I'm so curious to see what configurations the Clippers try out there. But I have to imagine that Westbrook and Kyrie will match up with each other in some capacity. Um, and, and even if it's not match up with each other, be cross-matched on each other enough times. And Westbrook is capable of making an impact. He doesn't do it every night, but he is capable of like winning no, matchups. There's no players. doubt. No doubt about it. I'm, not, I'm certainly not selling Russell Westbrook short. I mean, I, I right. he's been he's he's been one in his time in the league, he's one of my favorite players to watch. I respect and appreciate his his desire. He brings it every single night. Sometimes every it night. doesn't look great because his shooting abandons him, and then it can be ugly sometimes. But absolutely, 
has has the ability to, to have an impact. When you have a guard that's capable of getting you 10 rebounds any night, what that does for your team defense, his speed and pace up the floor and the pressure he puts on people, he's relentless, he's, he's always going to keep coming. You know how badly he wants to win. Like All those things matter a lot in the playoffs. So yeah. I agree with you. That's a perfect X factor. I don't know if I have an X factor for the Mavs I because I would lean towards uh, Tim Hardaway Jr., but my X factor with him is I don't think this is a series for him because he's the one guy that I look at and I would worry defensively, okay, if he's out there, I think the, the Clippers are going to find him every time. And we might have a situation where it's like, you're scoring already without him. Do you really need the extra offense? So that's a guy that I look at. I, I, but again, it's not an X factor in that I think he can win the series for him. It's more an X factor in that he might have a, a significantly reduced role in this one. Uh, that's fair. I think for me, I got two other guys I'm looking at for Dallas because I think they have the ability on a given night to do enough offensively that can really help them out of a tight spot or, or a, a, like an important in a quarter or something where they you keep them in a game. Exum and PJ Washington. I think yeah, both those of those guys, too, yeah. both of those guys, they're going to be out there for a lot. They're going to play a lot of minutes. And, you know, Exum is a guy you just value because he's really smart, man. And, you know, just, he moves yep. the ball well. He's got good size, right? And then, yeah, when he scores, it's great. Uh, and he had that big three last week, which, which was huge. But for me, like, he's capable. He can have a night where he makes four or five threes in a game in this series. And I think the same thing about P.J. Washington. He's going to get a lot of looks because there's so much attention paid on Luka, Kyrie. Like, there's only so many guys available in the court defensively to rotate. Exum and Washington are going to get clean looks. And I think each of them has the ability, maybe it's on a different night in the series, where they make four or five of those. And it, it, it really helps out, like Batum did for Philly last night, where it's not like every night. It doesn't have to. But like on a given night, in a tight game, maybe we were down eight and P.J. Washington hit two of them in that spot. They cut it to two, and you're like later on, you don't notice that that happened. I'm like, wait a second, that could have gone to 15 right there if, if he doesn't hit those shots. Like that kind of stuff I'm talking about. I think Exum and P.J. Washington both have the ability to have that kind of a stamp on the series in addition to the other things that they do well. I love the Exum call. I think I think that might be it. P.J. Washington too, honestly. Both of those guys, with, with P.J. Washington, it's almost more narrow. He's going to have to play defense against some of the toughest one-on-one -on -one guys. He's going to have to make an impact, but I think he will. And then the shot part is the one you just can't predict. He's a guy that you can't just pencil him in for, oh, he's going to shoot 38%, 39 Like He's either – if he shoots 40%, 38% or above, I think Dallas is going to win this one. But he's capable of 30% on in a series when we talk about a reduced sample size, and that would change the percentages, I think, for Mavs winning this one. And Exum, to your point – you can't guard Luka, and I think the Clippers are going to figure this out very quickly, that they, they, they even them, with all their great defenders, are still going to be placed in a compromised position. Exum is my favorite release valve, although they have several release valves on that team. When you talk about trapping Luka and he gets rid of it to somebody going downhill, I love when Exum is that guy just because he's such a great finisher, playmaker, and all those different things. Any other final thoughts on this series? Other than, not, other than the fact that I can't wait till Sunday at 3.30? No, because... That I'm, I don't for you. I don't know about you. For me, that's the series I'm looking more forward to than any. Yep, yep. Same, same with me. Uh, cue that outro music, Emma. I know we have some super chats to get to. We can get to those here in this outro part. What do we got? First one, Cam says, "Legs, if you were in your prime, which play and team do you feel would benefit the most from your skill set? Which team would you rather play for?" This is a fun one. Ooh, ooh, that's a good one, man. Uh, wow. Uh. I think I could definitely help out Philly and I'd be fun to do it, you know, in that town. So I'll go, I'll go Philly. <laughs> That's right. That's your region. So uh, there you go. And that zone, I'm thinking you're getting a lot of, uh, a lot of shots. Psycho blue says, Tim, this July, if you're down in RVA visiting folks, head over to Tyrese Rice's b-ball camp at Meadowbrook and teach the kiddos what NBA best three point percentage mechanics looks like. Tell them Aaron sent you. All right, man. I like. I'll take. Listen, I'll take that to heart. I'm in RVA every summer, man. I go down to see see fam, and uh, I've, I've been I've been in the works trying hard to get a basketball camp put together down there for a while. It's going to happen sooner rather than later. Maybe next summer. Uh, keep there an eye know. out for that. But I'll, I'll I'll make sure I do that, man. Well, he paid two Super Chats to bring it up. He also says, also, I caught up on yesterday's show. Sadly, Kyrie didn't hit the 65 game requirement, so he can't be all NBA. What? Who supplants him? Oh, that's right. He was on your team, but he was below the threshold. A couple people pointed it out. I don't remember. Was it Booker? Who else did I don't you have? have I don't have that list in front of me anymore. Wait, here you go. Who are my extras? I had uh, Lillard, Mitchell, 
Bancaro. Uh, Mitchell's off too. He didn't hit it Anthony either. Davis. Oh, yeah, okay. Anthony Davis. Yeah. I'll go AD. How about that? Add one All more right. big. All righty. There you go. Who else? Another one. My goodness. He's paying us nonstop. Zion, Caruso, and Butler are examples of the dire stakes of the play. And so many things can go wrong in a one and done Man, you that lying. can't be bounced back from. You are so not true. lying, which is exactly why all the people try to talk about manipulating outcomes to avoid right. Denver. When you're talking about the Lakers, and that's exactly what I said on the air. It, you know, you go ahead, you throw that game and, and, and against New Orleans, and put yourself in a one-off situation where you could be going home for the summer to avoid Denver, and somebody rolls an ankle. That's exactly why I said it. It's, you know, what there are so many things to be pointed to in the regular season that take place that can prevent you from being in this situation. Just ask the Warriors, and we talked about this day with Draymond Green. With everything Draymond Green, he missed 30 games. They're 14 and 16 in those games. Look at their record yeah. when he plays. If he can avoid that, some of the stuff he got involved in, the Warriors aren't even in the play-in. So it's, it's, you take care of your business in a regular season because in, in a play-in situation, anything can happen. I agree. Nate Dunn says, feels bad that White's career high will disappear into the void because in a, not an official game. How do we feel <laughs> about this and can we change it? It is funny, man. Some of these records that don't count in the play-in or in-season tournament, they're not official record. Listen, if, 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 if I'm somebody that's, you know, I got a, I got a beef with Kobe White. Anytime he says he had 42 in a game, I say, no, you didn't. <laughs> Show me. Show, Show me. me. Where's that? I don't where, see where? There's no record of such a thing. What are you talking about right now? They got, they got to think about doing something about that, man. It counts. Listen, it uh, counts. Yeah, it does. It does count. Um, you know what? I have a feeling he doesn't mind. Uh, guys, that does it for our show. We have one more show for you. Actually, two more shows tomorrow. Tomorrow, we will be live. We're going to be breaking down the rest of the playoff series that we haven't talked about yet. And then we'll be dropping our betting where we're betting on every single series, who's going to win it and how many games. So keep an eye out for that. Hit that like button for us on the way out. See you guys on the other side.